Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this Good Friday service. And it's an absolute joy to be able to celebrate with you. We will be in a short while uh, celebrating also just a brief communion service together. So uh, you might like to stop the video at this point and get together the elements, some bread and some uh, juice of some kind, and we'll celebrate together in the Lord's Supper. This morning, as we begin our time, I want to read to you from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 53. Verses 4 to 6. Isaiah's prophesying, he talks about Jesus here. He says, Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we consider him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That reminds us of the incredible burden that our Lord Jesus carried as he was nailed to the cross. He became that incredible sin offering, the perfect Lamb of God, slain for each one of us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be together as your people. To remember Jesus, our Saviour and our Lord, and the incredible sacrifice that he made for us. Thank you that he took our place on that cross. Thank you that the price he paid is sufficient for the sin of the world. We worship you and we praise you. We thank you for the cleansing that he offers to each one of us. And we thank you for the wonderful way that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray when he said, Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Well, as we prepare ourselves for communion this morning, I'm going to read from, not the usual reading I usually take from 1 Corinthians 11, but this time from Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 26, which talks about the Last Supper. And after the Last Supper was, was over, Jesus celebrated together with them. And, he, and, he, and this is what happened in Matthew chapter 26 from verse 26. It says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. So let's follow the example of our Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you for the bread that's before us. We thank you that it reminds us of the body of our Lord Jesus. And that he urges us to partake of the loaf and to eat. The loaf becomes part of us. In the same way, we need our Lord Jesus to become part of us. So, Father, we ask for your blessing upon this meal. We recognise that it's because of our sinfulness that Jesus had to come. That he physically took our place on that cross. That he died for us. That he gave himself for us. We worship you. We praise you. We thank you in Jesus' name. So let's take together a piece of bread and let's eat, remembering our Lord Jesus. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Father, we thank you for this cup that reminds us of the blood of our Lord Jesus. We thank you that we have a new covenant 
in the blood of Christ. A new covenant that grants us the forgiveness of our sins. And through our receiving of Jesus as Saviour and Lord, we are granted the gift of eternal life. We ask for your blessing upon the cup and your blessing upon us as we drink together in Jesus' name. Let's drink together. Father, we thank you that you've given us the opportunity to have a simple memorial meal. To remember exactly what Jesus has done for us. Thank you that through our faith in our Lord Jesus, we can know the gift of eternal life. We worship you with grateful hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning on this Good Friday, we're going to spend a little time looking at God's Word. And I want to read to you this morning from the Gospel according to John. John chapter 13, verses 1 to 20. And in this particular chapter, John talks about Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Let me read the verses for you. John chapter 13, verses 1 to 20. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave the world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer garment, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew he was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he'd finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. I'm not referring to all of you. I know those who I've chosen. But this is to fulfill the scripture. He who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. I'm telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you'll believe that I am he. I tell you the truth. Whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me. And whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. This is the word of the Lord for us for this Good Friday. Well, today as we, we explore that and, and open up these words a little further, I want to talk about radical leadership. Because on this night, this night of the, of the washing of, of the disciples' feet, on that particular night, someone needed to do something. The text says that Jesus knew perfectly well that his hour was close at hand. He knew he would die soon and his disciples would be without his leadership to hold them together. If there was to be a church eventually, then Jesus needed to do something that night. He needed to take some leadership, some initiative and do something to make things turn out all right. Will he arm the twelve? Grit his teeth and say, follow me and... Charge the temple complex? 
Will he lead them out of the, the city quietly and hold up until the crisis is over? What will he do? He does something radical. He washes the disciples' feet. It's a night for heroic deeds, for leadership, for action. And he washes the disciples' feet. That's the act of a slave, not a hero. Yet, the one who washes the disciples' feet is no slave. John reminds us in the introduction to this scene that Jesus is in complete control. He knew that his hour had come. He knew about Judas' intention to betray him. He knew he had come from God, and then when they'd killed him, he would return to God. A slave does things because he has to. Jesus does things because he wants to. He's not controlled by circumstances. But he chose carefully and deliberately to do what he did. And he did it, the text says, as Lord and teacher, not as a slave. When you think about this, you begin to realize just how radical this act was. Jesus is completely redefining what it means to be his follower, his disciple. Because everyone respected him, his followers, they respected him, and they acted with appropriate humility. I mean, we can all do that, can't we? We all know who our superiors are, and we can act with proper respect and humility towards them when we need to. That's no great virtue. The humility, however, that Jesus called for went far beyond this. He says, if I, your Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you ought to do this for each other. This is all about discipleship, without status, without pride, and this is a radical idea. Let's face it, you and I, we're pretty good at putting people into boxes, aren't we? You know, he's nothing but a drunk. He'll amount to nothing. Oh, she's some ivory tower intellectual, probably hasn't done an honest day's work in her life. Or oh, there's another, you know, welfare family sponging off my tax money. We know how to put people into boxes, don't we? But what if, what if we took our leader seriously and followed him? Because Jesus is plunging into the fray. He's opposing the whole world system of dividing people up into more important and less important people. I've washed your feet, he says, now follow me. If we ever really stopped trying to make ourselves better than someone else and concentrated on improving everyone else's lot in life, what a world this would be. He washed their feet. What an act of radical leadership. This morning I want you to note four things from this passage. First of all, this was an incredible act of love. Foot washing could be an act of love in Jesus' world. I discovered that there was an interesting, that there was a popular uh, romance story from Jesus' day. And this story had a scene in which the husband was uncertain of his wife's devotion to him. So she washed his feet to show her true love for him. Well, Jesus loved his disciples throughout his ministry, but now he would show them just how much by one specific act of love. He loved them to the end, or as the NIV says in John 13 verse 1, he now showed them the full extent of his love. John likes to use words that can mean more than one thing. Here he uses it in this phrase, the phrase to the end, it can mean completely, in, in that uh, Jesus would give them all of his love. And surely this foot, foot washing showed them by that by demonstrating how, how far he's willing to go to prove his love. And to the end can mean all the way. And with his death approaching, somehow this foot washing was also a symbol to them of this act of love in which he would sacrifice his life for those he loved. He was the King of kings and Lord of lords would now do the most menial of things, often the act of a slave. 
He's showing us how much he loves us. He's showing us the next thing that he's going to do, which is an incredible act of sacrifice. The foot washing is a symbol of Jesus' sacrifice. Look how John draws out the comparison, comparisons. It says that Jesus lay, lay aside his garment. He took off his outer garment. Just as Jesus has already said, he was going to lay aside his life voluntarily. And after the foot washing is over, he takes up his garment again and he dresses himself. Just as he told Pilate that he had power to do with his life. He poured out water to make them clean, just as he would pour out his life to make them clean in his death. So there's a picture of sacrifice. There's also a picture of love without limits. Jesus will say just a little later that the mark of his disciples was their love for each other. He says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you love one another, even as I have loved you. This is love. This is discipleship without any limits. It's a love that does not stop, not even for death. It doesn't stop in any way. It makes any sacrifice that is necessary for the benefit of the other. Jesus did it. And he called us to follow his lead. We're going in, he says. And instead of filling their hands with weapons, he dies for the life of the world. And what are we called to do? We are called to follow him. Live a life of love without limits. There's also a picture there of complete cleansing. When you, when you read the story, it's almost, it's almost a funny scene. It's not really funny, but it's almost there in the first part of the section where, where Jesus and Peter are having their conversation. You can imagine the scene. All the disciples are, are stretched out on pillows around a low table. They're leaning on their elbows with their feet out away from the table. And Jesus begins to wash their feet one by one, finally winding up with Peter, who as the leader of the twelve is saved until last. And Peter draws up his feet a little and he says, you aren't going to do this, are you, Lord? And Jesus responds this way. He says, I know you don't understand what I'm doing, but you will later on. And Peter says, I know this much. You'll never wash my feet. And Jesus has just told him that he wouldn't understand. But Peter makes up his mind anyway. Isn't that just like Peter? You know, he jumps in before he even thinks about anything. Then Jesus says something puzzling. He says, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Another word that's used for part is share. He uses the word share that was in the Old Testament, a word for the share that the tribes of Israel had in the promised land. So Jesus is talking about us sharing something precious that he has to offer us. And what does he have to offer us? It's our salvation that he's talking about here. So the washing is a symbol for Jesus offering grace and forgiveness and we must accept that. The conversation continues. Peter says, if I must be washed to, have a, to be a part of you, then don't just stop at my feet, do my hands and my head as well. And Jesus again does something a little odd. We can paraphrase again, verse 10. Is, is, he says, he who is washed does not need to wash again, but is clean all over. In other words, Jesus is saying that what he's offering, this incredible gift of salvation, this incredible cleansing for our sins, represented by the washing, it's a permanent remedy for our sin problem. It's a permanent cleansing. Once you've participated in Christ's washing, there is no need for any further cure. Jesus washed their feet. His was an act of a slave going over the top to show us discipleship without pride, without arguments, over status. His was an act of sacrifice, showing us discipleship without limits, love that doesn't stop even for death. His was an act of salvation. And here I have to say that we as these disciples cannot participate in salvation. We can't save ourselves, we can't save others. 
But we can follow Jesus into the world, into the fray, into the battle, not with guns blazing, but with our Bible open and with words of hope on our tongues. We can tell the story of what happened on that first Good Friday. And Jesus promises that when we do that, and when others receive our message, they have received him as well. This is radical leadership which Jesus gave for us. And we are to follow him and live just as he lived. We are to love. We are to sacrifice. We are to love without limits. Because Jesus has completely cleansed us. And as we share that message of that first Good Friday, others too can receive complete cleansing of their sin. Would you pray with me? Father, we want to say thank you to you today for the incredible example that Jesus set, for the fact of his death, the great wonder that he would humble himself so much. But Lord, we also recognize that you've commanded us to follow you to wash one another's feet, to put aside our own pride and our own symbols of status, to become nothing and to love completely. And as we love completely, you have the chance to love others through us. So may this Good Friday be transformative for each of our hearts, that we might become more like Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, dear friends, as we bring this brief service to, us, to a close, I'd like to bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace this Easter. Amen.